Um, hey, Dr. Worley. Uh, congrats on, on congrats on being the first uh, voted faculty spotlight. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. Yeah. Um, so what I did is I had um, all the English students vote on a faculty member, professor that they would like to see um, spotlighted on the social media accounts. And I had them ask some interesting questions um, to get to know you a little more. Very cool. Yeah, and that's it's an awesome project. And you know, I'm again, I'm really honored to you know be able to participate in this. Yeah. Um, so I know that you are well, obviously an English professor um, and the director of the grad program. Um, but how long have you been teaching? So if you count the time I spent um, as a GA and uh, a little bit before that. Uh, more or less 20 years, right? Give or take, right? Um, so it, it's been a long time. Um, I've been here at Western for seven years. Um, and this is my second post after graduate school. I spent uh, five winters in North Dakota before this. Wow. A little yeah. different climate change and everything changed probably. <laughs> a little bit, right? A little bit, right? Uh, the, the snow up there is very much for real. Um, yeah. So it is, yeah. it is a little chilly. When I grew so you up- probably you probably know how to drive in the snow. Then, no, no, not at all, not at all. I, I had I had a very much beloved uh, '92 Volvo that I took up there, that um, I spun out on the ice one time, and that mm -hmm. was that was the end of driving in the Volvo. I don't think it left the garage for about four years after that. Well, um, yeah, I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so. Now that we have a little bit of the background, um, I wanted to ask you some questions that students sent in. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll go ahead and start light with uh, someone sent in, how are you so cool? <laughs> awesome. Um, so that question, I'm just gonna assume by cool that this person means uh, what most other people would refer to as ridiculous. Um, because the people you know who are closest to me constantly remind me uh, you know, that I am in fact, uh, very ridiculous. Um, so and I guess that's just how I am, is, uh, yeah. is, is ridiculous. So we'll go with that. <laughs> um, unafraid to be who you are, maybe. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, all right. And then what made you choose teaching? Who wants to know that? Um, so that's a great question. Um, and I guess, you know, a long time ago, I read that the only place a left wing intellectual can be effective in the United States is education. Um, and for the most part, you know, I think that's true. Although I constantly question how effective I am personally, right, in that role. Um, you know, whatever we may think of it, we genuinely live in a society, whether that's locally, nationally, or globally, that requires immediate deep structural change, uh, no matter what topic we're going to be discussing, whether that's uh, race relations, climate change, you know, we can go down the list. Um, and of course, this is complicated by the fact that, as a friend of mine from Yucatan, Mexico once put it, uh, you know, here in the United States, uh, we don't have a plan B, right? Uh, it's literally unthinkable that the U.S. Um, will not be a global power forever, that the economy is not going to expand continually, and that people here in the United States are always destined to have it better. Um, you know, so jarring people out of that way of thinking, you know, given that I teach here in the U.S., and introducing them to other ways of thinking, seeing, and experiencing the world uh, is really what led me to teaching. Um, you know, in most days, it does strike me as being more effective than standing on a street corner with a sandwich board and a bunch of crazy signs and slogans. Uh, but, you know, there are days when I'm much more game for that as an alternative. Yeah. Do you have a sign that you would, you would specifically make? It depends on the day, right? Depends okay. on the day. Uh, but it is a hobby that I have with my child. Nice. nice. Um, Got to keep your skills fresh. That's true. That's true. Um, so that leads into another question that a different student had. Uh, what's your favorite book to teach? Uh, 
again, this is a really tough question. Um, and I think honestly, rather than a single book, um, I really like seeing what happens between texts when students read them as a group. Um, for example, right now I'm having students read the narratives of Spanish explorers and, and African and indigenous peoples that all intersect with North Carolina in a number of different ways. Um, so, you know, because they're reading these texts together, I think that students get a perspective, you know, that there's a whole different world out there that exists outside of the Anglo-US canon, um, and one that includes a variety of experiences and perspectives, you know, on this very place that they call home, right? And so, you know, trying to complicate a little bit um, the perspective that they may, maybe they received, right, from just growing up in North Carolina. Yeah. Um, how would you say... Uh, you see your students change when they're reading books like that? Um, I think, you know, depending on how students have grown up, right, I think they draw a number of different, um, you know, things from these texts, right? Um, you know, like, for example, um, you know, just, just, just give you a couple of examples um, I have right here, right? Um, this is my copy of uh, Omar Ibn Said, um, who has uh, an autobiography that he wrote as an enslaved African in the 19th century. And his narrative is the only um, autobiography slave narrative by an enslaved African that is written in Arabic. And so it's, the type, of, it's the type of text, right? You know, it is rhetorically incredibly sophisticated. It's incredibly complex. Um, Said himself was a Quranic scholar um, when he was abducted and uh, sold into slavery. And so it completely changes, right, uh, how people think of, you know, the trajectory, right, of um, enslaved peoples, you know, not just in North Carolina, but in the Southeast in general, right, um, you know, as well, the perspective that I think a lot of people have on African cultures, um, because once again, right, he's a Quranic scholar, right, he's Muslim, right, he's fully literate. And, you know, these are the things in my experience that a lot of students, um, when they talk about the class afterwards, um, report not having known about. Um, you know, that, hey, right, <laughs> there, there were quote unquote Western religions, as much as I hate to use terms like that, right, you know, in Africa, right? Um, and so it really challenges, um, you know, those kind of preconceived notions. Um, kind of in concert with that text, um, you know, I'm re we're just, a, I've got them right here. Uh, so uh, we also read uh, Victor Montejo's Testimonio, uh, Death of a Guatemalan Village. Um, which is another text, um, which is about, it, it ends when Montejo uh, flees Guatemala as a refugee during the Guatemalan Civil War. And there are Guatemalan Maya communities right here in North Carolina. And of course, those, many of those communities began leaving Guatemala, um, you know, during the 1980s when Montejo leaves. And so, you know, in a way, right, the story of those communities is also links up with Montejo's story. Um, you know, just two more quick examples. Um, Leila Lelami's text is another text um, that we're reading um, in conjunction uh, with these other texts. And it recounts a story of the Narvaez expedition. Um, it's a Spanish expedition to Florida uh, way back um, in the 1500s that uh, ended up, there were only four survivors, right? Um, you know, we, we get these narratives of European um, settlement um, in this area is though it's just this nice linear progression, right? There's a settlement, more people come, right? And then the next thing you know, uh, there's 13 colonies, United States, independence, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, this is one of those expeditions uh, where literally between bad decisions and hubris, everyone dies but these four people. Um, the only sort of the fullest narrative we have of that, of course, is by one of the Spanish explorers um, and not of the enslaved African who was participating in this expedition. And so Lailami, as a Moroccan-American author, you know, recounts that expedition from this completely different perspective. And once again, right, you know, talk about Spanish exploration in this area. Um, in Morganton, we have the best preserved remains of a Spanish fort uh, from the 16th century in the entire Western Hemisphere, something not a lot of people know about. Um, and so, you know, again, Cabeza de Vaca's document is actually the first European mention of Apalache, right, which the Spanish word Apalachia, right, Appalachia, it's where we get it. And so, you know, these, these things, these voices are all there, right? If we sort of, you know, re recalibrate ourselves a little bit to be able to better listen to them. Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. Awesome. Yeah, I, yeah. I hope the students enjoy it. I'm glad you think it's yeah. cool, right? Uh, yeah. It, it can be a wild ride sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, I think one of the most interesting 
questions that I got, um, it's kind of a, not a double part, but mm -hmm. uh, got a little bit of a compliment in there for you um, that I would love to hear about. Um, they ask, how have you grown to be so accepting to everyone? Uh, you are one of the main professors I've had that truly cares for human rights and activism. I think that's such an important question, especially in the case. Awesome. Well, you know, I'm really humbled um, that the student would include me um, within that kind of group of people. Um, you know, as a professor, right, one of the things that I think we do um, is, you know, we, we do our best, right, to model our values and things like that. Um, and, you know, because, I mean, again, as I was, I was talking about earlier, right, we live in a world uh, where these things are so important. Um, yeah. And in my case, you know, speaking, um, you know, only for myself, um, I think growth is definitely the perfect word uh, since our experiences shape us and continue to shape us throughout our lives, right? You know, I'm always growing. You know, we're all always growing. Um, and in my particular case, you know, I grew up in a household where, you know, I came up amidst a lot of uh, cognitive dissonance, right, concerning, you know, the values of the household and um, the world quote unquote, how it is. Um, for example, you know, I grew up in an evangelical church, but I also went to Catholic schools, right? Which, you know, in the 21st century may not seem that much of a juxtaposition, but, uh, you know, in Charleston, South Carolina in the early 1980s, uh, was a pretty jarring thing for, you know, a five-year-old kid to understand. Um, you know, the first day after, uh, you know, first grade, I came home with just white as a sheet. And I told my parents, I was like, you'll never believe this they pray to statues, right? And so and my parents walked to me, they like, well, yes, because they are Catholic and they do things differently. But like, it was so far outside of the tradition that I'd come up in, right? It, where, you know, there were lots of people who would say that that is absolutely not acceptable. And so, you know, that was, that was a really formative experience for me, right? Both having the experience, but also my parents walking me through that. Um, you know, both of my parents have college degrees, um, you know, but my father's father uh, was a successful barber, despite the fact he was functionally illiterate. Um, growing up, I didn't want for anything personally in my nuclear family, uh, but my mother's parents both died of chronic conditions and inadequate access to health care long before I was born. Uh, when I was younger, an African-American woman took care of me and my sister in the afternoons, and she gave us, you know, a much different perspective on U.S. history and what it meant to be both white and black, particularly in a space like Charleston, that to this day remains profoundly segregated racially and economically and still struggles to deal with its own history. Um, you know, I can go on and on about that, but I guess I've always been troubled by this kind of slippage, right, um, between how we profess to love and value people, you know, particularly universally right in the constitution you know all men are created equal but yet how society at large devalues those same people publicly um you know you either work towards changing these structures that we exist in or you don't um and i you know i don't typically think of things being that kind of stark right um but in this case i think it's pretty appropriate yeah um well thank you for sharing all that um i hope that that helps encourage other students and anybody really to um, grow themselves. Um, um, what would you say is any advice that you have? Uh, so advice wise, um, I guess being uncomfortable is okay. Uh, you know, live in that space and don't be afraid. Uh, be patient with other people's and above all, be patient with yourself, right? Um, you know, talking about growth. You know, because when you're uncomfortable, you know, that's when you're learning something, right? And above all else, I guess, you know, stay uncomfortable. Keep yeah. growing, keep learning. Good advice. <laughs> um, okay. Um, anything that you would like to share um, about yourself? Um, anything at all? Um, just kind of as a last word, right? Uh, Black Lives Matter. Yes. Very good. Well, thank you again. Um, I am glad that you're the first one that we're going to spotlight. Um, it was a pleasure interviewing you, um, and I'll, I'll let you know when I post it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Alyssa, and thank you for the interview. This was awesome. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. Bye.